looks like we piqued your interest in the hideout. First of all, let me tell you what the hideout is not. The hideout is not for hustlers, for grinders, or for people who are looking for a shortcut to what the world calls success. The hideout is about growing as men, creating lifelong friendships, and having the time of our lives. Are you ready to tap in to the endless source that will take you from success to significance? The hideout is two and a half days of hiking, biking, and doing the little things that it takes to create lifelong friendships. I find that joy is nothing more than falling in love with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. And that's when we see growth in every area of your life. Have you accomplished your goals professionally and financially? and you still thirst for something more? Has success in these areas come at the expense of far more valuable things like your family, your children, and your relationships? Alignment in business, strategic partnerships, and joint ventures all come from true relationships. The Hideout is designed to get to know people before you'll ever need them. This is not your typical mastermind. The Hideout is focused on the one thing that will fuel everything joy. And when joy is overflowing in your life, you'll find growth in your marriage, your relationships, and oh yeah, your business. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast where attitude is everything. Uh, on, the, on today's show, I was, I was very honored uh, to be able to have this young man on. We became fast friends. Uh, we got on the phone a couple of, uh, it was probably a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it was like I was talking to my buddy who I had known for years and years and years. And he was just so complimentary of everything else that I was doing. And he had very little to say about what he was doing. But it's so amazing when you look into someone after getting to know them and realize the impact that they've had on the world. It changes things because you get to know people like we were talking about in the hideout. You get to know people before you ever need them. And most of the time people lead with what they do as opposed to who they are. And this man doesn't. He leads with who he is. He leads with his heart. And that's the reason why I wanted to have him on the podcast. Um, he's a, 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 a lieutenant. Or, or, I, I asked him his title and he was just like, ah, I'm, I'm good. But I want you to welcome to the show the the voice for uh, for American Law Enforcement podcast, the host of that, and Lieutenant uh, Randy Sutton. Uh, welcome to the show, my man. It's a it's a great pleasure to be here. I got a few other titles I can throw them at you. you yeah, know. hit me but with them. The show will be over by then. <laughs> well, I know that you are and have been the the most featured on the cops series. Um, you know, bad boys, bad boys, what you're going to do? I kill the store. I kill the, the, the vocals on it. Um, but I know that you were one of the most featured on that. Um, you're helping, uh, you're the founder of the wounded blue.org, which is helping, uh, law enforcement, uh, that have got wounded in, uh, in, you know, in service. And I want to dive right into that too, because why is this such a passion of yours and why is it so strong for you? Well, you got to go into a little bit of my history in order to do that. You know, one thing that I found that in order to have credibility with any audience, anybody that you're talking to, you have to establish a little bit about who you are, um, because there's so many there's so many people out there who are pretenders. Um, they have an agenda, and you, you you have no idea unless they they have a little bona fides, you know, a little bona fides. So I did 34 years as a police officer, Kelly. I did 24 with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I did 10 in Princeton, New Jersey, where the university is um, before that. And I got kind of bored being a small town cop. So I came to the big city and Vegas where I wasn't bored. I can, I can assure you of that. And I've done a lot of other things along the way. I wasn't just a police officer. Um, and, and, the, and the reason I'm telling you that will become clear as we go further along with the story um i've been like i said like you you said i was the most featured officer on the tv show cops from that that led to some movie roles like i did a role in the in the uh, academy award-winning film um casino with uh, sharon stone and, and robert de niro i acted in a, in a film with sandra bullock 
with, um, you know, a number of others. And I've done a bunch of television shows. I've written four books. My fifth one's coming, actually coming out in about a month uh, called Rescuing 911, The Fight for America's Safety. Um, and I was a police trainer for, for decades, literally. I, I, uh, I taught a, a, a subject around the country that's, that was a tough subject. It was called Policing with Honor, Surviving Your Career Ethically as Well as Physically and Emotionally. And, uh, and that was a very challenging, very challenging subject to teach because it, it's all about you know personal and professional ethics and that's a that's a difficult t- subject to teach because nobody likes to be lectured to about their personal and professional ethics but it was a very successful it was a very successful program now i tell you that because what led to my my retirement was that i suffered a stroke in my police car that's what ended my career and it was literally the most frightening moment of my life. I lost the ability to speak, to move. I crumpled to the pavement. 2.30 in the morning, uh, tourists are walking by me, taking their, taking my picture with uh, their cell phone cameras as I lay there helpless. Um, and uh, that was, uh, that was uh, a moment of the greatest fear that I ever had. And I wasn't afraid of dying. I was afraid of living like that, Kelly. And... Um, I'm a I'm a, a believer that um, that there was I I believe I've had an angel on my shoulder for my entire police career, um, having having survived some things that were very very difficult to survive, and that angel was with me again that night because the clot went through my brain, um, left some damage but certainly not what it could have left. So, uh, but it ended my police career. I should mention that my mother died in my arms three weeks before that. I was in a fatal shooting a couple of months before that. So there was a lot going on in my life. But suddenly I find that I have lost everything. I lost my career. I lost the job that I love. I lost my mom. Everything that I had prepared for in, in, at this stage of my life was suddenly taken from me. And it was, uh, it was a very dramatic time for me, uh, a, a moment of, of uh, great loss, but also led to what I call the gift of clarity, which I'll explain right after this, because that, that, what, what, what I thought was the worst thing could ever happen to me in my life gave me a great gift as well. Um, but then something happened that I never expected. And that was that my own department turned its back on me and refused to pay my medical bills. Now, they knew they were legally obligated to do it. They just said, we're not going to. And it was shocking to me. I, I, you know, here's the department I gave 24 years of my life to. I almost gave my life for on more than one occasion. And uh, suddenly, I'm nobody to them anymore. I'm a, I'm a case number. Oh, case number 001436. Um, denied. <laughs> what do you mean denied? You have to pay. Well, then you have to take us to court and, and make us. So that's what I wound up doing. It took over a year. Meanwhile, they destroyed my credit rating. I had bill collectors knocking on my door. I had, you know, incredible stress. And after you just suffered a stroke, that's about the last thing you want is stress. Um, and then uh, eventually I beat them. They had to pay all my medical bills and do everything they were supposed to do. But I learned something very, very valuable that I never expected. And that was my own department was hoping I was going to die in the meantime, in that year that it took. Because that way they wouldn't have to pay out what they were going to have to pay out for me. And I realized that I was, I was literally um, of no use to them anymore. But I thought that it was, I was the only one. Now, all that stuff I told you about that I've done in the past now comes into play. Because... Suddenly, that Facebook was becoming a big, a big entity at that time, and cops started reaching out to me with these terrible stories. Randy, I know you don't know me, but I was shot. My chief never came to visit me in the hospital. They're not paying my medical bills. Randy, I was hit by a car. My apartment turned its back on me. Randy, I, I mean, one story after another. Kelly, one story after another of heartbreaking stuff. And every single one of these stories ended 
I feel forgotten. I feel abandoned. I feel alone. Everything that I felt, everything that I felt. And many of these officers were, were seriously, severely wounded. And they were treated the same way that I was. And I go, so this is a national problem. There's got to be a national resource for these men and women because every one of them feels abandoned and alone. Now, Kelly, there's already a, a massive suicide problem in law enforcement. You add a severe injury to it, a disabling injury, it goes, out, it goes up about 1,000%. So realizing that this was a massive national issue, I looked for the resources for it and discovered to my shock that there were no national resources. So that's when the Wounded Blue was born. And uh, we've been operational for a little over three and a half years. We've helped almost 14,000 law enforcement officers with a team of, so, of very, very dedicated men and women, all who have been shot, stabbed, beat, run over, screwed up and screwed over, and they still continue to serve. So I have an incredible life now. Um, I work with people that I am so incredibly proud of, heroes, true heroes. And we're doing amazing work. We're touching the lives of people that and we're literally bringing them back from the brink of darkness and, and saving lives. So that gift of clarity was I knew that I was given a path. Mm -hmm. Well, and Randy, I, I, I generally would never do this, but I think there's a fan on in your room. And if you could turn the fan off because your, your content is so incredible. I want to make sure that everybody gets every single that. Yes, that's it. Fans um, off. Yes. I love it, man. Um, so can you talk to us? Cause most of the time people don't get to understand. They, they just look at it from a, a side of, um, maybe they don't have experience with it or they've had a negative experience. And especially in the last couple of years, um, law enforcement and the public, it, they, it's right. almost like the law enforcement got a black eye, but I have so many friends on the force in different cities that say, if you would see, if you could see it from my standpoint, you would see it different. Can you help us to see it different? Um, you know, see that those perspectives different and what the public isn't seeing that you're going through on a day to day basis when you're protecting and serving. Yeah, you're and you're 100 percent right. You see, um, that was actually one of the reasons that I did the TV show Cops. Uh, I was I, I thought then, as I think now, that there is a huge disconnect between what police do in reality and the way they're perceived. And that's not the public's problem. That's a police problem. Um, we haven't shown ourselves. We haven't shown ourselves who we are really as human beings, as people. Um, we've, we've retained that very stoic dragnet esque <laughs> kind of persona, nothing but the facts, ma'am. And, um, and we have kept ourselves insulated in many ways from showing and revealing ourselves as the human beings that we are. Um, actually my, the first book that I, that I wrote, uh, has a strong correlation to what you are what you just asked me. Um, I did not, I never intended to be a writer, but I had a life changing event. Um, when I saved the life of a one month old baby who had been shot in the face and, uh, her, uh, mom and dad and the baby are in a car on Sahara Avenue, right near the Las Vegas strip. This is a night at night. I was a Sergeant at the time. And these, these, uh, three gang punks pulled up alongside of them. And in a gang initiation, just opened fire on him um, for no reason whatsoever. One of the shots hit the baby in the face. Now, I literally came upon the scene. It wasn't dispatched to it. So I was there literally within a couple of minutes. And there's bedlam. There's a car up on the sidewalk. There's bullet holes all over it. There's people running around screaming. I have no idea what's going on. I don't know if the shooter is there. I don't know what I'm dealing with. I don't know if there's a threat. But I, but I, you know, I radio for backup and I, I called for an ambulance uh, when I saw that the, you know, I heard somebody scream, the baby's been shot. And then I saw down on the ground, there was a, um, a little infancy holding a one month old baby and she had been shot in the face and she, is, and she stopped breathing. And the protocol that we have to go by is you call an ambulance and you wait for the ambulance. But 
I knew that if I did that, that baby was going to die. So I, I violated the rules. I scooped up the baby in the first patrol car that got there. I said, get to the hospital, tell them we're bringing in a baby that's not breathing. And I was able to clear her airway. When she got shot, a bunch of the tissue and stuff went down into her throat. And, you know, keep in mind, her, her head is, you know, the size of a, a baseball. And, uh, and it choked her. So I was able to clear her airway, give her mouth to mouth, and bring her back. And because I was there within such a close time proximity, no brain damage. Wow. And, uh, and it, was, it was a magic moment for me. It was a life-changing moment for me. And then the parents came in, right? It was... Uh, It was a very emotional moment. And I went home that night and I got one of those bottles that's right back behind there mm -hmm. and uh, poured myself a scotch and I got out a yellow pad and a pen and I wrote the story. Now the baby's name was Jackie, so I wrote the story. Her name was Jackie. I didn't have anything to do with the story. I just needed to write it. You know what I mean? I needed to... I needed to get it onto paper, and and I realized from doing that that it was it was kind of really good for my soul, that it um, it allowed me a way to kind of exorcise that that um, that evil that had done this in a way. So I wrote it. I had nothing to do with it. Put it in a drawer where it sat for several years until the World Trade Center was attacked. And that was the deadliest day in law enforcement history. And I felt so um, helpless. Um, but I couldn't help those, those, men, those men and women that I, I racked my brain about something that I could do. And then I, I remembered that story that's sitting in that drawer. And I thought to myself, every cop I know has a story like this. Hmm. If I could get them to write those stories, not only can I raise money for the widows and orphans fund for the cops who were killed? But it would show the people that we serve who we really are from our heart. And that's exactly what I did. And uh, that book was called True Blue, Police Stories by Those Who Have Lived Them. It raised a significant amount of money for those families, but it also showed a different side. It showed the spirit of a cop. Mm. And... And, and, it, and it played two roles. One is it, it, it gave me an opportunity to feel like I was doing something important. But B, I learned from that. Cops started contacting me saying, Randy, thank you for doing this book because I thought I was alone in my feelings. So not only was, what, was, was it an experience to be able to, just as you, your question was, how do we, how do the people get to know their police? And it's really a difficult, difficult sharing of, of, of who you really are inside. You know, we don't even do that with our family sometimes. So, you know, cops see the absolute worst side of humanity over and over again. They're forced to do things that, are, that go against their morality, that goes against their, their instincts, that goes against their values because they're, they're forced to do it. And so you have a conflict inside and then you have, um, then you have the, the visualization, if you will, of things that should never be seen. And not once, not twice, but for 20, 30 years. And it takes a tremendous toll on the emotional well-being and the mental health of these men and women. So it's, maybe that was a roundabout way to, to say that I understand exactly what your question was. And the only way to get people to understand one another is to get to know each other. Mm. And that's not an easy thing to do. You know, all bias, all bias is, is born from ignorance and all bias is, is, is born from misunderstanding and whether that's bias from race or religion or or sexual orientation or whatever we fear what we don't know and the police can be feared 
and nobody likes to feel that either. And that's another barrier that is between the people and the police. So Randy, if you got to sit down and I had two groups of people, I said, Randy, I'm going to bring in one group of people, the first, and then I'll bring in the second group of people. And you're going to have two minutes with each of them. And I need you to, from your vast amount of experience and your not only experience in the professional world, but also uh, from your life experience and your emotional experience, um, I need you to download into them in two to three minutes. And once they go, they're going to they're going to apply everything that you said and they're going to walk out. But anything outside of that two and a half minutes, you're not going to you're not going to be able to pour into them again. And you've got this opportunity. The first group is every police officer in the country and they sit down in the chair and every, you got every single person. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of them and you get to address them. What would you tell them? I would tell them that everything that they feel from everything that they see and that they do is normal. When you feel like you are abnormal, when you feel like what you have seen and experienced is something that uh, is, is uh, something that no one else has experienced, you feel lonely. When you feel that lonesomeness, you feel diminished. And everyone reacts to a stimulation in a different way. And so every time that you feel something because of something that you said, you said uh, during an incident or everything that you were forced to do in an incident or everything you were forced to see, everything is normal. Don't feel like you are experiencing something that is, that is damaging to you because it is also has the opportunity to present you with incredible growth as a person, as a human being, and as a cop. Second group of people that walk in is, is the public. So this is going to be millions of people. Obviously, you're going to have to have a microphone, Randy, but you got a great voice, too. you got a sexy <laughs> voice, man. You're going to have a and – and you get to address them. You know, you have two, two minutes, two, three minutes, and you have a, to address them to help them to understand from the perspective of the police, you having that experience. I bring those people in. We usher them in. It takes a while, but we got the whole United States that's sitting down. What do you say to those people? That's a much more challenging, that's a much more challenging question. Um, if I could, if, if I had the, the pulpit to do that, I would tell them that I am you and you are me. There was the father, father of modern policing said this, the people are the police and the police are the people. And it's a, it's a phrase that, that needs to be instilled in every single one of us, both police and civilian. Because I am your brother, I am your sister, and you are mine. What I have chosen to do in my career is be a protector for you. I'm willing to put my life on the line for you. I've watched my friends put their lives on the line and give their lives in the line for you. I ask from you that you will honor me as a person, as a human being, and believe in me. So, Randy, let's let's go back. I mean, that is profound, man. I mean, because I, I think that if if the more people, again, like you're saying, if you if you sought to to understand what the other person was going through, then we wouldn't group people into you know, oh well. You, you look like this or you believe like this, so therefore you're going to act like this. And I think that we need to, as a public, need to understand that as far as the same way that we want that respect from the police. We need to understand that because every single time that I connect with a, with a police officer, and I've, like I said, i got tons of friends uh, that are on the force or been on the force or anything like that, it's getting to know that person not as a police officer first and it's getting them to know them as a person so let's rewind to young randy what part 
of young Randy had to be pushed down when you went on the force and as you grew in the force and as you were on it longer, that you had to almost take that little Randy and push him off to the side and he didn't get a chance to play anymore? That's a really, that's an interesting question. I, I, I'm going to answer it um, from, from a true little Randy perspective because I consider myself really fortunate in that I knew what I was going to be when I was a little guy. I knew that I was going to be a cop. That was my goal. And even as a little guy, I was a protector. I believed in protecting people who were, who were in, in danger, people who had, you know, the bullies in the school. Um, I was, uh, I was always a believer in that. I was a believer in, in, in justice, really, even as a, a, a kid. So I modeled my life towards the, towards my goal of becoming a cop. And in actuality, I became the youngest police officer in the state of New Jersey as a result of that. Um, but that's a, that's kind of a, the way I became a cop is a story in and of itself. And it actually is kind of germane to your, your question. So I was a police cadet when I was, uh, when I was 16 years old and 17 years old, they, the, the Princeton police department brought in a high school junior as a cadet. And basically I was a gopher if, if you really want to know what I was. And I made coffee for the guys, but I learned the culture. I, I, I went out and, and on, on patrol with them occasionally. Um, but I got to know them as human beings and as people. And as a result, I, I, you know, was, was instilled in that sense that this, yeah, this is the decision. This is what I want to do. So I graduated early from high school. I was 18 years old. And that allowed me to, they had just changed the age of majority from 21 to 18. So you could drink and you could vote and you could become a cop. And uh, I took the police test. Now, here's the reality of small town policing. We had a 30 officer department. If you took a police test, that list, the chances of you getting hired were minimal because there were a couple thousand people that took the test. And then the test was only good for a year. And generally speaking, there was no turnover in that department anyway. So anyway, I took the test. They didn't want to, they, they knew they didn't want to hire me. I was too young, but they didn't want to insult me either. And I, I tested well and they made me number two. So I knew I wasn't going to get hired. That, so I just continued on with my life, but they, they still used me as, as a special officer. So even though I was going to college at night and I wasn't working there full time, uh, if they had a problem, they would, you know, they needed an extra hand, they'd call me in, right? So one of the people that I, from the time I was, I, I was, I'd taken the cadet job over there, was I worked with a, with a, with a guy who was a desk, desk officer. And he was a, he was a crusty old guy. Um, he was on the desk because he'd had some medical problems. So he didn't go on patrol anymore, but he was a patrol officer. And this guy was a former, you know, service member, crusty old cop, pretended he was gruff, but in all reality, he was, he was a gentle, kind man, despite what he put out to everybody. And he kind of took me under his wing. And, uh, and, and we had some great conversations when I was working alongside him and I got, you know, I knew all about his family and, um, and it, it was, uh, it was a really nice relationship. So fast forward, I'm now, uh, you know, I'm not working. I'm in college there. I was on the, the list to be hired, but knowing that I would never be hired. And we had a hurricane come through. I think we lost Randy for a, a second, but um, the station identification that I want to uh, that I want to hit to you right now is the fact that we got to make sure that uh, we're communicating on a high level. I think that we have Randy back. There he is. There's Randy. He's back in the in the place. I, we lost you just for a second, but that that communication, Randy, I think is so important. So uh, continue on, man. I apologize. I think I lost your audio though, so your audio is is out. Um, as we work through the, uh, the, the audio part is, uh, and I hope you're, you're understanding is 
you know, from a public standpoint, we need to make sure that we're taking the time to get to know people, no matter what the position is. If it's the police, if it's the uh, firemen, if it's all first responders, not only that, but just people in general, getting to know them. And I think one of the coolest examples uh, that I see with Randy is, honestly, like, it's, it's, I, I did the research on this young man, and he is so phenomenal, but when you get a chance to just talk with him, um, Randy is all about making sure that you feel like you're on top of the world and that your voice matters. Let's see if we've got him back. Randy, can, can I hear you now? No, I can't hear you now. Uh, what I would do is I'd probably drop off, uh, go ahead and uh, just just drop out of the uh, the call, and then you could come back in and we'll bring you back in. Uh, which is uh, very, which, which will work well. Um, so, uh, you know, anyone out there with family or friends in law enforcement, I want to make sure that we, you know, that we connect the dots because the the amount of things that are seen um, in, let's see, I think we got Randy back. There we go. We got you back. And what I was saying, I was just finishing a thought, Randy, because I was saying that the things that are seen by law enforcement, by first responders, I mean, we, we're going to get into this, but you can't even imagine. Some of the stories that I sit with my friends, as a, as a listener out there of the podcast, you can't imagine what a person goes through. I mean, with, with my job, right? So with what I'm doing. I don't go through any traumatic experiences like what Randy does and did on a day-to-day -day basis or any of you who are first responders. So make sure that you take the time to ask the questions because if you ask the right questions of the right people, you'll get the right answers. So Randy, you're, you're back up, man. I apologize about that. I know we had some uh, technical difficulties, but that's the way that live TV is. I, I get it. I get it. So you can hear me okay now? Yes, sir. Great. All right. So, um, so I, I, I'm, there's a hurricane that comes to our city and I know that they're going to need help. So I go, to, I go up to the police department and, um, and, and go to help answer the phones on the desk. Um, and John, Johnny, my, my friend, I was just telling you about is scheduled to come in three o'clock and work the three to 11 shift. Well, the, the storm is, is, is a, is a massive hurricane. Trees are down buildings, you know, you know, it's a hur it's hurricane, geez. So three o'clock rolls around, Johnny's not there. And uh, so this is an all hands on deck kind of deal. And I figured, and, and we all figured that he probably couldn't make it in because of the, of the storm. So it's, it's a madhouse, you know, people are, you know, calling for rescue. And, and uh, so I, I finally, a couple hours go by and I, I have to go use the bathroom. So I run down to the locker room and I open the locker room door and laying on the floor is Johnny. He'd come in and had a heart attack on the locker room floor. And I yelled for help. Uh, guys came running down, you know, of all the times, of all the times you need medical and, and you're in the middle of a hurricane. Um, so I did CPR on him and I couldn't bring him back. And, uh, So he passed away. And as, as the coroner is coming to take him away, um, one, of the, one of the officers comes up to me and says, I guess congratulations are in order. And I said, what, what are you talking about? He says, you're getting hired now. Mm -hmm. It was not the way that I wanted to become a cop. But I also believed that in some, in some way I could create a legacy that honored him. Randy, what part of little Randy do you wish you could have back? Well, 
That's an interesting question. My father was not someone I would consider a wise old sage. He was a very human guy and a great and a great dad um, who who treated me with love and respect. I literally had a beaver cleaver growing up experience. OK, I'm not, I mean, I was born in Princeton, raised there had loving parents, uh, had a great childhood um, and. Uh, uh, he, he like I said, he was he was he was not but he wasn't a, he wasn't a philosopher, OK? But he was also a guy that could make friends in a phone booth. I mean, we'd walk into a restaurant and he'd be making friends with the people in the line. And it was and, and it was something that I always admired. But I could never really accomplish. So if little Randy could come back. Little Randy would try and absorb that that type of uh that type of uh demeanor and that type of uh, personality um that he had well it's it's it, it, it's news to me when you say that though randy is because we hopped on the phone man and i felt like i mean that was our phone booth i mean you connected so quickly and it was like you know, you found commonalities, which I, I think was amazing. And I, I want to stay on this subject for a little bit because as we get older, right, responsibilities come in. Now, my responsibilities, you know, I got into the professional uh, beauty industry at 19. I didn't go into law enforcement. I didn't go and see the things that you saw. But I'm saying that even in my life, the little Kelly that grew up and was like, love and break dancing or taking my little boom box to school or whatever it was there's parts of me that is like i had to almost squash that a little bit because i was like you got to be a responsible adult you have that times a million right so i want to stay in that little randy part where when you want to be a cop like as a, as a young kid you want justice generally when you're wanting to fight the bullies you've either either experienced it yourself or you've seen someone close to you get take a beating or whatever it is and you want to make a difference which one was it for you and is it does that ring a bell for you yeah oh no uh, and your, the answer to the question is both i was um i was very sickly as a child um i spent a lot of a lot of time in and out of hospitals as as a, as a kid and um nobody could figure out what was wrong with me and i had Part of my symptoms were that I, I, I literally had no energy. I was confined to bed um, a large part of my childhood. And I couldn't play sports. I had I, I didn't have the I didn't have the energy to do it. Um, and my parents didn't know what was what was wrong with me. Like, I, I mean, I spent I spent three months in the Philadelphia Ch Ch try, try again, Children's Hospital when I was 10 years old undergoing every test known to man, I think. Never figured out what was wrong with me. And uh, but that affected my child. It affected me as a child because, um, you know, I, I was I was I was lonely. I was alone. I couldn't go out and play with the other kids. I had some I had a couple of really good friends who were my friends to this day, which shows you how long ago that was. Um, but it was it, it had a profound it, it can't help but have a profound effect on you. It also gave me two other two other components of my of my life that that are continue with me today and wound up having a serious impact. One was my love for animals, because I grew up. My companion was my cat. Mm. And so my love for animals is is well, I got seven cats now. I'm the crazy cat man. OK, I admit it. All right. So. <laughs> But it also, it also gave me my love of reading, because if I can't go out of the house, what am I going to do? So I I read vociferously, and that's what wound up leading to my career as a writer. Because I was I, I learned the power of the written word, I learned the joy of the written word, and and so it had a huge effect on my life. 
so when so my parents were desperate right they didn't know they didn't know what to do um and then a friend of theirs had terminal cancer and was and was given a death sentence and out of out of desperation they went to an alternative doctor a holistic doctor and that doctor saved that woman's life wow. and my parents were desperate and they got the name of this doctor and i'm not saying this guy was normal because he was not he had only he only had the alternative is right he only had office hours from 12 midnight till four in the morning so my parents wake me up one night uh, come on we're taking you to the doctor and even as a 10 year old i knew if my parents were taking me to a doctor at one o'clock in the morning i'm seriously screwed up right so they did they take me to this brownstone uh, house in, in the city of Trenton, knock on the door, and this little bird-like man opens the door, and he ushers us in. Dr. Samuel Getlin was his name. Ancient, ancient man. And now I'm used to, like, every modern, you know, type of medical device, I'm going to be poked and prodded and pricked and everything else. But he brings us in. He has me give him a urine sample and a blood sample. And then he says to us, go wait in the waiting room. I'm going back to my lab. So he goes back to his lab. I'm sitting there in this very uncomfortable silence with my parents. We're like, this guy's got a, his waiting room was cluttered with National Geographic magazines from the 40s, right? I look at his, I look at his diploma. It was from 1929. And, and they're all, my parents, I saw, it was very uncomfortable for them. They were like, what are we doing here, right? And then he comes in, doctor comes in, ushers us into his exam room, sits me down and said, he tells me every symptom that I've had. I don't tell him, he tells me. And he says, you've, you've been depressed, your weight goes up, your weight goes down, you you're, have no energy. And, and my parents are like, yeah, yeah. And I'm going, yeah. And he looked at my folks and he said, you, here's what you feed your child. Cheerios, cheeseburgers, this, that. And they're going, yeah. And he said, you're starving your child to death. Your, your, your son is highly malnourished and nutritionally deficient. And that's what's affecting him. He has, a, he has a, uh, something called hypoglycemia and nutritional uh, deficiencies. And I had never, no one, of course, this is, this is in the days before, you know, holistic health was something that was well known. And he gave me 72 vitamin pills a day to take and a strict, strict diet, no sugar, no white flour, everything that we know now that we shouldn't be eating. Right. I went on the way you should be eating. My mother had to learn a whole new way of cooking and it saved my life. And, it's, and it changed my metabolism to the point where I could grow, be healthy, and and become what I really wanted to do. Um, be, be physically active, to be in shape, to be well mentally and physically and psychologically. And it literally saved my life and gave me the opportunity to follow my dreams. And then he was murdered. He uh, was walking home one night, got mugged, they hit him in the head and they killed him. And that had a profound effect on me. Hmm. How old were you when he got, when he got murdered? Just, just a couple years after, uh, so probably about 12 or 13. Wow. How do you process that at 13 years old? Like, I don't know. I mean, I remember at one point, I think I was in third grade and there was a kid who had come by our house one time. And then we heard the story where he was supposed to go to school and he didn't go to school and someone broke into his house and he ended up getting murdered. I didn't know the kid that well. I wasn't connected with it, but emotionally, like it was just this, it was almost like a movie that was playing out in my head. Right. At 13, you were so close to it. How did you, how, how do you process that? 
I saw the I saw the sadness and the injustice. I felt the loss, and I and, and it it made me it it I think it it boiled into me a hatred of criminality. Mm. That here was a man who had done so much good for so many people, have his life taken in a violent, violent way. And um, and it just reinforced, like I said, I already knew what I wanted to do, but this truly reinforced um, my my drive. Randy, how do you control that part of it, right? So this is a drive when you go into being a, 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 law, a, a law enforcement officer and you're like, you know, I, I dislike, strongly, strongly dislike um, injustice and people who do the injustice to people who don't deserve it. Right. How, do, how do you control this, though? Because, I mean, I'm thinking in my head, if I went into that scenario, then I would be looking for a criminal and I'd want to take it out on them. That's the reason why I, I don't get a chance to be honored to do what you do and what you've done. Right. How were you able to control that and how are officers able to control that as they move forward? Because, I mean, it, it, in my head, you would be justified in going hard. Well, there, <laughs> well, there are times that I went a little too far in my career. Um, I can tell you one of the one of those is I I uh, I'm, I I deeply love animals, and I was on patrol one day. This is when I was in Princeton, and I saw this guy dragging this dog down the street, kicking the kicking the hell out of him, and he was the dog was in terrible pain. And I stopped my patrol car. And I basically did the same thing to him that he did to his dog. And it was not the brightest thing to do. And I, ver I ver got very close to losing my job over that. I got a pretty hefty suspension for it. Um, now, I look back and I say, I'll take that suspension any old day. For, <laughs> for right, I'll take the punishment <laughs> for that. Um, but but in, in all reality and in all truth, Controlling your emotions when you are in a highly emotional state of being is truly one of the most difficult things that a police officer does. Controlling your emotions, and this is a double-edged sword, Kelly, because learning to control your emotions to that point where the, where the worst, uh, worst things you could possibly see being placed in a situation that no human being should ever, and you have to be stoic. People are looking at you as the police officer to be the rock. You can't fall apart. You're on a scene and there's bedlam and there's devastation and there's death and there's this and there's that. You can't fall apart. You've got to be the rock. And we, we do that really, really well. We, take those emotions and we draw them inside and you're not going to see it at least for a while you may not see it for years eventually those distilled emotions will have a severe impact on you and that's why what i do now in my role in the wounded blue is so critical because i literally deal every single day every single day with someone who is in trauma. And many of it is over years and years of being exposed to things and, and bottling them up and not letting, I mean, I, I tell you what I liken it to. And this happened to me, this happened to me in my career. So I, I know it. You have, like, you have an emotional glass and beginning on day one in the academy, when you have to do some when you, you have to do something you didn't want to do in the academy, but you're forced to because you, you have to do it. That first drip goes in there. And then over years, you go on, on, a, on a death call and you, your emotional drip goes in there. And it may take five years or it may take 30 years, but you're going to get to a point if you don't understand how to empty that glass occasionally, that that glass is going to drip over and that's when you're in trouble 
um, you know, I, I, I get that. I understand it. It, it happened to me. So how, how does a person, um, because I have a friend who's a first responder. His name is Jay Hobson, and uh, he was talking about it. And there, you know, nowadays uh, mental health is something that is just it rolls off the tongue. It's normal, natural conversation. I just had my daughter on the podcast. I was telling you, 13 years old, she's talking about mental health. She's talking about depression. She's talking about anxiety, and it's just normal, just out there. You and I, growing up, it, it, there was a there was a, a cure for mental health, which was called "suck it up and and make it happen," right? And right, it, or right. or it was a, a a smack upside the head, and it was like you need to focus or you need to, and we joke about that as men, but a lot of times we don't have the the forum to be able to. So, how do you take a person who grew up in that and grew up in you need to be a man? And being a man means that you push through things, you hammer through, and then you're coming to them and telling them, like, let's talk about emptying out your cup. They're like, I ain't got no cup, man. I'm good. How do you, how do you begin to, how do you begin that process? Well, and that's, that is part and parcel of everything that I do today. Um, we are, we're having a, uh, I created an event, a conference that's going to be held next week in uh, Indiana called the National Law Enforcement Survival Summit. Now, you think of the word survival, people sometimes think, oh, it's officer survival, tactics, things like that. And it's a little bit of that. But there's so much more to surviving a law enforcement career. It's physical and tactical, absolutely. But it's also psychological and emotional. It's about how you deal with your families. It's about how you deal with the stresses financially. It's, 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 so encompassing and that's how you reach out by allowing people to understand that what they're feeling is normal it's the feeling of abnormality that keeps us from being truthful about what's going on and that's what that's and we've been conditioned as you said to bottle it up keep it inside and then one day it comes to a it comes to a head and that bottle breaks or that where that top comes off. So now we are we now know that there are tools, that there are ways and many much of it is about communication, about knowing that we're feeling normal. And then we we have we have uh, times when I'll get together with some guys who have faced some serious stuff and we'll sit around a fire. And you'd be surprised about how people unload. And when they unload, it is good for their soul. So that's, it is really about camaraderie. It is about being honest about what you're feeling and being comfortable enough with the people that you're with, like, like my group, like others around the nation, that allow you to be in a, in a safe situation where nobody's going to laugh at you, nobody's going to feel... Like, like you're, you're less of a human being or less of a man because of, of what you're going through. And that we are breaking through now. There, we are literally, the, 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 the reality is that there is now becoming a more acceptance of this reality. And so guys who, who you never would have thought would open up before are, are willing to now. As long as they know that they're with somebody that's trusted, somebody that's got their back, and somebody that's got a pathway forward. So, Randy, what should, what should we, as the, as the public, never ask a police officer? How many people have you shot? What does that do? What does that make you feel like when someone, because there are those dumb questions, right? And my mom, my mom would say, there's no dumb questions. Uh, and I would say, mom, yes, there is. Because I remember asking a guy who was 6'8". I was like, I walked up to him and I was like, do you play basketball? He looked down at me and said, do you play miniature golf? I realized what he was saying when he was saying it. How does it make you feel like when a person comes up on you? And that's a pretty normal question of, you know, from a, from a person who's, not dumb, but ignorant to the circumstances. Yeah. How does it make you feel when a person's asked that? Well, first of all, 
that question has probably been posed to me a thousand times over my years as a cop. And I have to kind of, I just have to kind of shake my head and go again. You know, it's just, it's such a dumb question, but yet it, it is, it's literally, and, and what it shows is it's what's on the mind. That means that's the perception of that person, that that's what cops do. You know, the reality is that almost 95% of police officers around the country will never ever use their firearm in their entire career. They'll never shoot, they'll never, they'll never, never even fire at somebody. But the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the propaganda that's been, and not only propaganda, the, the entertainment value that that has been instilled in the public since God made little peach pits of here's what cops do. They go out and get in gunfights all the time. And then they're back to work the next day and they do it again the next day. And, and some people actually, this is where people believe that, that art, you know, uh, uh, mimics reality, you know, that, that this is the, that this is a cop's reality. And, um, so it's just it's one of those questions you just want to say you know please just just go away you know <laughs> you're but, such a nice guy so, you're such a nice guy well here th- but here's the here's the reality here's the the reality of Hollywood and programming okay I would I was given a, 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 a amazing opportunity when I was a patrol officer to travel to England and and meet with um, the the London Bobbies about policing in America. From this is all from being on the show Cops, by the way. Um, I, and, and if we have time, I'll tell you a very funny story about what happened. In I'm in. I'm in. All right. So what what happened was Barbara Langley, who is the producer of Cops, they sold some footage to a production company in England. Call, and it was called a video called Police Stop America. Now, this is an 8-track, or not 8-track, um, VHS days, okay? So it's going to show you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? That, so I'm dating myself in a major way here. So it was a vastly popular, um, a vastly popular uh, a video. It was one of the most popular in the country. And they, when they bought the footage from... Barbara Langley, they saw me as part of that footage. And they asked Barbara Langley if they thought that they could hire me to be the host of the show. So they did. And that's how I got the ability that after, after it went to England, um, it created such a, uh, an interest that they flew me over there to do a press tour. And part of that press tour was, the talking, was talking to British Bobbies. So I'm, I'm, I'm there in there. They, they, they have a very, they can't go into a restaurant and eat. They have to go to the barracks. They have barracks and just, it's, and they, they have their meals prepared for them. So I'm there talking to these, these British Bobbies. And of course they're not armed unless they're in a special unit. And the, the British cops are saying, how many, how many people have you killed? How many times they literally, this is no lie. They thought that I would come in to work, go out, get in a shooting, come back, have my dinner, go out, get in another shooting to go home. And this is, they, this was many of the officers actually thought that we got into gunfights on a natural, normal daily basis. And I'm explaining the, the realities to them and they're looking at me like what <laughs> so so that's conditioning for you that's that that's the that's what hollywood has has ingrained in people's heads right so let me tell you something funny though because this this cracks me up to this day so i when i went over there the sheriff at the time here told me it was okay to wear my uniform over in england for these for this press stuff he loved the idea that a vegas cop was in england talking about Vegas Metro, right? So he loved it. So I had my full uniform except for one thing. I, I couldn't carry a gun over there. So I had a rubber gun in my 
in my holster, right? <laughs> and so when I first get there, um, I meet with the, 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 you know, I'm a patrol officer, okay? I'm a nobody. But because I'm in this media thing, they treat me like I'm gold. So the fr first day we get there, I go to meet with the high commissioner of police and they usher me into this, into this massive office. This guy's got the whole command staff there. I'm a freaking patrolman. And I walk in with my rubber gun and my uniform and they've got a picture of the queen. This is, this is like James Bond, man. They got a picture of the queen, huge picture of the queen behind his desk. And, and after all the introductions, we say, he says, I say, do you like scotch? And I said, well, sure. He pushes a button. The picture of the queen slides off to the side. <laughs> and there's a wall safe. And he opens it up and he takes out a bottle of single malt scotch. And that's the way we spent our afternoon. Okay, so. All right, so the next day. I am supposed to go to the BBC and debate with a high-ranking British government person about arming the police in England. I'm about as qualified to do that as, uh, uh, but I, I can I, I can get through this. So I go to the I go to the BBC in my uniform with my rubber gun and we're walking through the you know the office is a huge building and as we walk through suddenly i get knocked on my ass and i get pushed down into the into the the, the carpet and i get my handcuff my hands pulled behind me and i get handcuffed margaret thatcher was in the building doing an interview and the secret service see this weird guy in this weird uniform <laughs> with this weird gun and they didn't play. <laughs> they, they, how quickly, how they, quickly did they learn that it was a rubber gun? Oh, very, very fast, very fast. And they, and they were very apologetic. Oh, gotta be sorry, old man. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was, it, it was one of the funniest experiences of my life, really. <laughs> so, Randy, uh, talk to me, too, because whenever you're in a profession and you understand the profession, then we see movies or TV shows about it, and we're like, that is absolute crap. You know what I mean? What is the closest thing to what it felt like, whether it be a movie or a TV series, um, that is the closest to what you actually experienced outside of Cop Rock? <laughs> 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 well, um, actually, there, there's there's two really, two really good examples. Okay. One was from way, way, way back when. Um, there was a, a TV series called Police Story, and it was written by James by Joseph Wamba, okay. who was one of my heroes. He was one of the early uh, writers who transitioned from being a cop to being a best-selling author. And his books, I've read every single one of them multiple times, and in a, in the in a weird kind of sense of of of, uh, of uh, legacy, he wound up giving me a jacket quote for one of my books after I met him. So so that was pretty cool. But he he was the first one where there was a real, you know, there was Adam Twelve, of course, which was that you know it was all very staged, very you know dragnet that kind of thing. But police story was very, very real, and it was based on his experiences as a cop. And he could uh, it, it didn't last very long because I think it was too smart for the for the television audience at that time. Um, but that was a, that was really really close because it it really talked about the emotional side oh. and the and the toll that it took on the cops. And so that was way ahead of its time. The other is a series that's on right now, which I think is probably my favorite cop series called Harry Bosch. And it is, uh, it's a Michael, it's based on a Michael Connolly series. Michael Connolly has, he must've gotten an intravenous drip of copness 
because he can, he's he's got great connections because he uh, he knows everything about the LAPD that anybody could ever want to know, including their politics, their procedures, and everything else. And he created a character called Harry Bosch. I read every one of his books too, of course. And then they did this series, which is I think in its second transition. But every one of them I've loved, and every one of them has been has been, you know, so true to life that um, that uh, I really, truly enjoyed it. Randy, can you turn it off? Like when you go to a concert, um, because the reason why I ask this is my buddy Brian, Brian Gates, you're listening out there, you know who you are. Um, my buddy Brian Gates is a, uh, is a high level, uh, he does high level security. So, you know, for Aerosmith and, you know, travels around the world, does all this stuff. And when we were at like the Texas Roadhouse one time in Austin, me and my wife and him. And he goes to sit down and he grabs my wife and moves her to another chair. And my wife was like, what's going on, Brian? He's like, well, you see, I'm in the corner. I can see everybody. My back is to the wall. He said, if there's an active shooter that comes in, I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you inside that hostess stand. I'm going to cover you with the hostess stand. And then I'm going to make sure. And my wife is just looking at him like, I'm about to get some chicken. Um, so, uh, Brian, you know exactly what I'm talking about out there. So, is there a time where, uh, you know, the experience where you could just unleash and 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 just enjoy where you don't have to worry about that, or is it always on? Is that spidey sense always with you? Well, I'll illustrate it with a story that happened not too long ago. Okay, good, good, good. Well, I was uh, I was flying. And um, I was in the aisle seat. And as is my habit, I watch everybody that walks on that airplane. And I do gauge for, for possible threats. Um, where No matter where I go, I do that. That's, that is part of what, you know, being situa situationally aware. That's what we call that. And it doesn't mean, I don't, I don't believe in being paranoid. I believe in being prepared. But... I also know the real realities that anything can happen anytime to anyone. And I also know that I'm an individual who has been trained to react competently and, conf and, and uh, confidently, no matter what the situation is. You know, there, there are cops I know that, that don't carry their guns off duty. And uh, um, I could never live with myself if, because I did not carry my gun off duty, and something happened where I could I could save a life and I didn't because I didn't come prepared. I couldn't live with myself. That just didn't, that's not in my DNA. So when you're walking out and you know you're armed, you, you do want to be aware of every situation that you're in. So I wasn't armed on this particular day because you can't bring a gun on an airplane unless you have, you know, special dispensation for it. But I'm watching the people that are coming up. And my 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 sense as soon as this guy walked on the airplane i knew he was going to be a problem he was loud he was obnoxious he was clearly under the influence of something and where do they sit him right in front of me <laughs> so i i i know something's going to happen i don't know when i know because i he just he's an idiot so he he's instantly as soon as we 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 uh, were up in the air he starts giving uh, he starts giving some lip to the to the uh, the airline uh, what do they call them flight attendant now I didn't I didn't use the old term which is sometimes ingrained in my head uh, flight attendant and she's giving him a warning he wants to drink more and she says sir I'm not serving you anymore and that did it he was pissed and he's cursing her and and. I know it's going to escalate. So I go to the back of the airplane where she is and I showed her my badge. And I said, look, just in case we're on the way to Vegas, just in case you need, if you just give me the sign and I'll take care of business. <laughs> so we're, we're continuing. He goes, this goes on for about another half hour. And then he does it as she's walking by, he reaches behind her and grabs her ass. And she turned around, she was pissed, and she did this to me. And he didn't know what was going to happen next. 
but <laughs> I just went and did what we call a carotid hold. That's one of the things that's now illegal for cops to do. And I grabbed him, lifted him up from behind, dragged him onto the onto the uh, the floor of the of the uh, of the the flight, and uh, held him there because now, believe it or not, every almost every every flight crew has handcuffs now. Basically, the captain came out, got the guy handcuffed, and he just laid there face down for the rest of the flight, screaming at me, telling me what an asshole I was. Hey, Randy, have you ever have you ever made the call like that? Like you're seeing it and you know it's coming, and then it you were wrong. Uh, where it it happened to be just uh, you know like uh, uh, a coffee cup in some guy you know in some guy's bag, and you thought it was. Did you ever have have you ever had this happen? Well, there there were there were there were times when I would when I would uh, like we could, we would get calls all the time reporting somebody that's suspicious or and you know you got to you got to treat it like it's real until it's not. Yeah. I just lost Randy again, but uh, he's probably hopefully he's going to go into that story. Um, probably one of the most interesting ones too that hopefully we're going to be able to get into once we get him back. Um, I think that we have him back is uh, talking about um, Randy. Are you there? Okay, I'm going to have you drop off and then come back on because I think we lost you just for a second. Um, so with with Randy, he also was in the movie Casino, and uh, the movie Casino. Uh, is near and dear to my heart because I lived in Vegas for 14 years and, um, you know, it's been an amazing, amazing thing. And I want, I mean, as, as we get a chance to be able to connect here, um, I want to know about that experience with, um, Randy, are you there? Yeah. Got me. Got you. So I was, I was just talking about my affinity for Vegas. Okay. And I know you're in the movie Casino. And uh, probably one of my one of my favorites and um, Tony Alamo, who you and I said that we had in kind of in common, uh, amazing man. And I remember asking him, I said, how much of the story of Casino was, you know, he, he knew it because he knew all the people. Um, how much of it was Hollywood? How much of it was real? And he gave me a percentage. What would you say when you watch Casino? Um, how much of it was true to the stories that actually happened and then how much of it was Hollywood? I'd say it was pretty true to form. Um, I mean, I wound up knowing a lot of very interesting people here. And, and, and you know, when the statute of limitations was up, I got their stories. You know? <laughs> so, Did you get so. a chance to have interaction with Tony Splatra? No, he was gone by the time I got on. I came on in 86. Oh, you did? And okay. he was pretty, yeah. I, I forgot when they put him in the ground, but it was about that time. So, Randy, there, let me ask you this about Vegas. There's, the, there's the, the side of you don't hear a lot of stuff that happens in Vegas. Uh, and, you know, you have the, because we were there for 14 years, you, you have these things. Is there um, any um, truth to the fact that things that happen in Vegas don't go outside of Vegas because of the tourist touristy side of Vegas. I would say that, that they limit some of the um, some of the stuff that would normally be in a newspaper or uh, on a on a, a news story. I would say that <clears throat> that they that they keep it to a minimum um, until they can't keep it to a minimum anymore. But yeah, they're not. They're not going to go out and 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 uh, and highlight how tourists are getting jammed up on on trick rolls. Uh, you know what a trick roll is? I don't know. Give us the trick roll. Okay, so just in case you didn't know this, there's a lot of prostitutes in Las Vegas. Really? Wow. I know it's a, I, I, it's a shock. Lord. It's a shock. I know. Yeah. And uh, and uh, the casinos have have a lot of them. And they're and they're you know they're beautiful. They're some gorgeous women, and many of them are just in it for even a you know it's a thrill for them. Uh, but others are predators, and so they they uh, they come they come uh, equipped with with drugs that will 
you know, once they get somebody up to a room, if the guy's got a nice Rolex or, you know, appears quite well, well off financially, they'll, uh, you know, buy me a drink and let's go up to the room and they'll put something, you know, they'll roofie up his, uh, his uh, drink. He'll go to sleep and he'll wake up with nothing. Sometimes locked onto the, <laughs> onto the, the uh, patio outside, if there's still a patio. And, and this happens a lot more frequently than you would think. And they're not out there advertising that, I can guarantee you. So I want to I want to switch lanes really quick because with Wounded Blue, um, I had a conversation with a guy uh, at my daughter, my son's school, and he was a police officer. And he told me a very similar story that you had told me where he got hurt in the line of duty. He, he actually got uh, there was a, a guy. Um, he, he, I think it was a meth uh, like a meth head that had super strength. Right. And he said he got picked up and he got body slammed and it, it shattered his back. And he right. thought, I'm good because the force is going to take care of me. The city is going to take care of me. And they straight bolted on him. And uh, he had to go through lawsuit after lawsuit. And he had to go through all these things. Can you talk about – because from, from my standpoint, I'm like, that, that would never happen. The city would take care of them. They're the number one. We want to make sure that our uh, officers are taken care of. Is this a common thing that, that happens uh, you know, it's it's so common that I created it's so common that I created an organization that has to deal with it. Yeah. The answer to that is, yes, it is. And it's heartbreaking. And it's also hard. You know, when I, I go ahead and try and raise money for my organization, because it's we run on charity. I don't take any salary. I put more money into the damn thing than I do. You know, so. Raising money is very difficult. Try to explain to someone who has a normal set of values that a police officer can get shot and not get the proper medical care and get thrown away by his department is almost inconceivable to them. As it was to me, as it was to me, I was a 34 year cop. I never expected it to happen to me. So in order to get that message across to you and to the people that are in in, in in the real world that you're in, it is very, very difficult. And and so that's a ch- constant challenge that we have. I mean, I have a documentary film that will blow anybody away if they watch it. It's called The Wounded Blue. It's on Amazon.com. Bring your tissues because you're not going to believe what you see. But that's our reality. Now, it's not everywhere. If, if, you get, if you, you're in New York City and you get severely injured, you're going to, because they have a strong union, they have strong laws, you're going to get a good pension, you're going to get medical care for the rest of your life. But if you're in many other places, that won't be the case. And that's why we constantly have to fight and, and constantly have to battle um, this, this, what all, the only thing I can consider it is, um, is lawlessness on the part of, of uh, these police agencies and the cities. Very often, it's not the police agency per se it's the bosses above them who make who make the rules and it all comes down to one thing it comes down to dollars and cents mm. how much how much can the can the city save if they throw you away wow so randy if if the if a person is in jeopardy say they get wounded right if you were to look back at it Right. Because you went through, I mean, and I'm going to, I'm going to make a really horrible comparison, um, but I'm just going to ask you to stay with me. Um, well, I'll give you two, uh, two experiences that are not going to be anywhere parallel and people are going to not like me and they're going to like you even more. So was, this is going to be good for your reputation, right? <laughs> Number one is an audit, having an audit as a business now, after this audit, like I went through with my accountant and I was like, damn, there are some things that we need to make sure. Now we were completely clean on the audit, but we were like, if we would have done boom, 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 we would be so clean for the next audit that's coming. Yeah. And then the other one, um, you know, it it was, uh, we, we created it within our business. It was called a break-in packet and every single business, this is one of the number one things I talk with businesses about when I consult with them is they'll come in, they'll be like, I need leadership. I need culture. I'm like, do you have a break-in packet? And they're like, what is a break-in packet? I said, well, you need to have every single thing in an envelope 
from the glass company to your alarm company to the door company to uh, where you got your computers, the uh, serial numbers, all those things you need to have in a packet. And when you get robbed, because it's not going to if, it's going to be when, when you get robbed, all you have to do is break the packet and then you go down the list and it makes it easy. We made these in all of our locations and we would get robbed and within two hours we were back up and running. Now, here's the comparison. This is the off, awful comparison. But when I say that, Every time I go through an experience, I write something down and then I make it a procedure for later. If you were able to make that procedure, or you probably already have it, if a person that maybe hasn't got wounded in the line of duty, how can they get prepared now, even if they've not been wounded, to make sure that they're everything, they're all their ducks in a row when they do get wounded and they'll get taken care of? That's actually a really, really good question. And, and, there's there's so many difficulties in this in the answer to it because every there is no consistency in in the laws governing the states for workers compensation injuries and for what benefits they have what responsibilities the the agencies have so you can have a police officer shot in the same place uh in in new york and in oklahoma and they, they're vastly, vastly different. Um, in, in New York, they've got, they've got plans, procedures. They've got it. They got it wired in, in a small town in Oklahoma. They've never had this happen before. That's actually one of the things that we do is we educate law enforcement officers and law enforcement leadership. We, I, I created a course of instruction called Walking with the Wounded. And that's the precise reason that we did it, to prepare beforehand, because many police agencies have never dealt with a severe injury of one of their cops. They're, it, sometimes they're not doing it by, because they they want to they 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 want to you know be. This they they don't mean to be insensitive. They've never prepared for it. They don't they don't have this, the procedures in place. Hell, there's. I can tell you that many agencies don't even know what benefits are available for a police officer who's been severely injured in the line of duty. So for the officer themselves to become educated as to what their, what the, the workers comp rules are in their state, that's a difficult task too, because they are so complicated and so convoluted and you have no idea what benefits are available in your state, in your town. And so to, to research that is a monumental task. And it could, and, it, and it, you'd have to ask your union, you'd have to ask your department, you may get the right story, you may get the wrong story, um, but it, it's, a, it's a very, very tall order. So Randy, this is honestly like the first time that we talked and you explained to me about your organization. This is why it's so important to me and I want to put my money where my mouth is, is that's why we're making you guys, as far as the woundedblue.org, we're making you guys a principal sponsor of the podcast because I want every single person out there, whether you're, you have a, uh, you are in law enforcement or mm. you have a family member or you have a friend the, this type of information, like right when you were saying it, my head was exploding because I was thinking, oh man, in my head, again, the simple side, it was like, okay, cool, let's just bring everyone together and then let them know what if it happens. But you were like, every state is different, every city's different, every state, you know, all, all, the, all around. It, it, it's mind blowing. Plus, on top of that, you're having to risk your life every single day. And thank you for every single uh, uh, first responder out there. And, you know, but it's amazing that that we have organizations like yourself that have dedicated like that you're throwing your own money in too, and and moving towards that. I mean, I just think that it's I, my hats off to you, man. Well, this is this is my duty now. Um, you know, I uh, I'm I have a sense of mission. I always have. Uh, and and I know that this was the path that um, was given to me. So. I will continue on the path. I will continue to be a warrior and that warrior being fighting for the good. And that's, that's, that's what we have to do. We can't ever stop the fight. Um, I tell you, I'll know I'll be what success would mean would be when my organization never needs to exist. 
Can you say that once again? Because most people are like, I'm going to be successful when my organization raises X amount or makes X amount. And you just said that. I my organization, my organization, I know that we will have been successful when we as an organization no longer need to exist. How can a person get involved? Because I think the start, this is one of my buddies, Sean Finnegan said this, the start is generally what stops you. People have good ideas, good intentions, but then they don't know where to start. They, they want to be a part of what you're doing. They want to contribute. And I had a person say this at the pool one time. I was at, uh, in our neighborhood pool, and I said something about a homeless outreach that we were doing. And they were like, yeah, I love that, and I've, it's always been a passion of mine. I just don't know what to do. And I was like, well, what you could do is you could buy a pair of socks and give them to me, and then I'll take them to the, to the homeless shelter where we go, and, and that will make a difference. And they were like, wow, it's that simple? I said, yes. How can a person take action and get involved with the Wounded Blue uh, organization that, I mean, whether it be on a, a small level, a large level, whatever it is, how can they start? Well, I tell you, you know, uh, I was actually having this conversation with my with my collective team, and and I said if we could just get ten thousand people across the United States to each give ten bucks a month, Starbucks money, we would never have to go beg for money again. We could we could complete, we could be uh, doing our mission on a on a on a really good level, um, and I wouldn't have to go beg people for money, which I absolutely despise. And I fully believe that there's a whole lot more than 10,000 people out there that would be very, very willing to do just that. But in order to reach them is very, very, is difficult. I mean, you got you to have the budget to reach them, right? I mean, you have very successful charities out there that have, you know, unfortunately, you know, campaigns that are worth millions of dollars that brings them millions of dollars. When you're a struggling organization like mine, you simply don't have that budget because you got to use your money for operational stuff and, and you, you just don't have it. So I'm, I'm actually, that, that one of my missions is to devise a way using the resources that we have, social media, um, to bring 10,000 Americans together and, and help us help, help us be heroes for the, for the heroes that are out there. It, it simply doesn't take that much. So that's now that's one way to get involved. If you're if you're a citizen and you're you're a police supporter, you believe in the mission, you believe that, that the cops are doing the right thing, and you feel like you know these officers are, are need your help. Um, if you're a police officer, it's a it's a different thing. Um, there, we have a lot of if you want to become a member of the peer team, and you've been injured in the line of duty or you faced serious um, emotional trauma and worked your way through it. Uh, or, or the spouse, uh, we, we are going to be increasing, uh, I've already tripled my team in the last, uh, two, three years. So that's another way. The other, the other way is become part of, of our mission and, and tell others about it, share this information with others, come to the, the events that we have, like the, the, the national law enforcement survival summit and realize that that there are people out there that are just like you. And if you're struggling, we are literally a phone call away. Hmm. What, it, what would you say to the, to the spouses out there, whether it be the husbands or the wives of, of law enforcement that aren't in law enforcement, but they are because they're married to it. And I find that, you know, communication in that is, you know, I, I used to jo we used to joke with one of my buddies. His dad, um, he would come home. He was he was in law enforcement, and he would come home, and we would ask him like, "How was your day?" And he would hit, hit us with the Bruce Willis. You know what I'm saying? That that one quick <laughs> liner, same shit, different day. You know what I yeah. mean? Like he would hit that one, and we would know like, "Get out of here! It's time for me to be able to do whatever." Like, what can a spouse do, or the family do, and what questions can we ask? Because we asked the I asked you the the question we shouldn't ask. What questions should we be asking of our police officers and our first responders? You know, this is this is a massive topic because when when the police officer is hurting, the spouse is hurting, the children are hurting. 
Um, it isn't just isolated to that to that one guy. And and now that's another thing that we're just starting to understand that. And so creating a, a bond and letting your your officer know that you accept them and you are you can't force them to talk to you. All you can do is let them know that you love them and you accept them and that you're there for them any time. Now, we also, we're starting to, um, we have uh, a retreat that we just did a deal with, um, with uh, Camp Patriot to bring officers who are, who just need to, need to get away sometimes uh, up to the beautiful mountains of Montana and cost nothing for them. The Camp Patriot, which is an amazing organization run by a former Special Forces guy, um, is just opened this up to our our people from the Wounded Blue. And there's other organizations too that do this. There's family groups. That's why, you know, the Survival Summit is so important. Uh, but I urge this, that, that we have support for wives uh, or husbands, spousal support, and they can reach out to us anytime as well. Randy, you're a superhero, man. I mean, it's amazing because, I mean, and I know you're going to deflect it and be like, no, those are the true superheroes. You are one, man. And uh, to see what you're doing in a man on a mission the way that you are, um, you know, we're going to have the links to everything, to the website. Um, we're going to have links to the uh, to the documentary, which I think every one of you should see. Um, and, you know, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to have just a direct button. Um, you know, we'll, we'll all get that link from you um, that where they could just click the link and they could just go and donate because we, I mean, 10,000 people um, donating $10. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, let's, let's, if you're listening out there, let's make this thing happen, you know, but I want to congratulate you, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to be able to dig into the things that you do because I got a slice of just who you were. Like we got the chance to just chop it up on the phone and, you know, it was like, I mean, a person that is, and I know you're very humble about it, but you know, being on, uh, you know, being on Fox and in Vegas and, you know, like, the last time when I talked to you, I think you were in between uh, going to the station and you're an expert witness and you're all these things, <laughs> but yet you're still Randy who is going to connect with people on a cellular level. And I just, I want to congratulate you on that, man. I think it's well, amazing. I, I, I appreciate that. You know, Louis, can I highlight one other thing? Of course. Um, you know, there are so many people that do support law enforcement and never really know how. So there's a woman, you might even know her. Um, she's out, she's on the speaker circuit a lot. And her name is Laurel Langmeyer. Um, and she is, uh, she's a five times New York times bestselling author on how to, how to, how to sustain your assets and your wealth and build wealth and, 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 and keep it for your family. Uh -huh. And, um, she and I are, are friendly. And when she heard about the wounded blue, um, she contacted me and, and she said, I want to help. I want to help your officers. So she's doing a a conference um, October 26th through the 28th in Reno, Nevada, called Gen W. And what she is what she has done is pretty remarkable. She's uh, she's made the Wounded Blue her charity. She's also normally this is 400 bucks for a couple. Anybody in law enforcement gets it for free. And then she's brought me on as the MC of the entire program. So I'm going to be there um, up in Reno, October 26th through the 28th, being part of this amazing program. Because as I, this is this is the, this is the reality. Officer safety also includes your family's financial security. Mm -hmm. If you're worried about your financial security, especially if, if the worst happens then that's going to have a negative effect on you and your family. So this is a phenomenal opportunity. Um, October 26th to the 28th, if you go to Laurel, I'm sorry, Ask Laurel. That's okay. Ask and Laurel, L-O-R-A-L, asklaurel.com slash Randy Sutton. <laughs> well, you get we'll in do, for free. What we'll do, Randy, is too, if you just shoot me over that, uh, shoot me over that link and we'll put it in the link for the bio. So, you know, then that way uh, in the bio, all you have to do is just click the links and you'll be able to go right to it, which I think would be amazing. So, and of um, course it's not just for cops, it's for everybody, but 
it's my focus, of course, is law enforcement and Absolutely. first response. Well, I, I, I thank you, man. The, the whole reason why I started the podcast is because iconic people like yourself. You've proved yourself iconic, I mean, the, from the first conversation that we had. Uh, but, Randy, I started it because I wanted to take iconic people like yourself, and I wanted to show my kids, Maddox and McKenna, that iconic people like yourself are not superheroes. You're just human beings with phenomenal attitudes and crazy work ethic. And um, Maddox is 11 years old. Uh, the sports guy in the family, and McKenna is the uh, the actress and the artist in the family. And so uh, what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could say both their names, it would be awesome, Randy. Oh, for, for Maddox and McKenna, I, I tell you this. You have an incredible future ahead of you. You have a father that loves you, which is amazing this day and age that you got uh, somebody that cares about you that much, who gives you what you need in life. He's giving you the nurturing you need. He's giving you the tools that you need to be successful, whether that success is in your financial ways or in your artistic ways or in your sports ways. Because by giving you that love and by giving you that, that um, support as you begin your journey through life, which you're going to have a wonderful journey. Um, always remember it's based, based in love. Randy, you're an incredible human being, man. And I want to, I would love to, uh, the opportunity to have you on more. We need to talk about this more. We need to keep going at this subject until every, until it's not a thing that, that people will be like, oh, wow, I'm shocked that uh, a, a police officer is going through this or that their family is going through this. I want it to just be commonplace. Um, so I want to have you on as, as often as possible. Um, I'm going to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life, Randy. Um, <laughs> and I just, I, I love you, man. I, I, I thank you so much for your time. And uh, I just, I it really, a, it was a pleasure to be here. It really was. Well, I really, really appreciate it. And you are officially off the hot seat. <laughs>